today's guest is Shep Hyken. Shep is a customer service and customer experience expert. I mean, expert. He's got a ton of books. He's won a bunch of awards. And I'm really, really excited to、uh, speak to him today. Shep, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited just thinking about it. <laughs> so, Chef, your title, Chief Amazing、uh, Amazement Officer. When did that start? That's a great yeah, title. Uh, you know, I, that's a self proclaimed title, obviously. How many Chief Amazement Officers have you heard of? I can't remember where it was, but somebody said, you know, it'd be really, really cool if you had some creative title.、Um, and I started looking and I saw, and this has been going on for years. Uh, the chief、uh, manager of first impressions is、yeah. what they call the receptionist. I said, well, there's got to be something for me. How about chief amazement officer?、Yeah. And it's stuck. And it works because as you look at my books, I have The Amazement Revolution,、uh, Be Amazing or Go Home,、uh, create, you know, my cult of the customer, create an amazing experience. So I use that word amazing a lot. And our mantra here at Shepherd Presentations is to always be amazing. We want to be amazing to our clients and teach our clients to be amazing to their customers and clients. Yeah, absolutely. So, when did this all start for you? Because, you know, when you're growing up, where you're like, I want to be a customer e x p e r i e n c e Exactly. <laughs> From the time I was 12. <laughs> yeah. So, the truth, it's not far from the truth.、Um, yeah. My roots of customer service started at age 12. Wow.、Um, and I could actually say it started when I had my first job. I was about eight years old, and my grandpa took me three days a week to work in his pharmacy.、Mm. And I was just a little kid, and I did inventory and I painted and moved things around. And I did this for two summers. But at age 12, I started my first business, which was a birthday party magic show business. Oh, wow. And when I came home, it was a Wednesday afternoon after school. Mom picks me up, takes me over to perform for a bunch of screaming little six year old kids. I get back in the car, I go home. It's dinner time. And mom says, What are you doing after dinner? Now, it was a school night. So I thought,、ah, I'm supposed to do homework. She goes, Not until you write a thank you note. That was my first lesson in customer service、mm-hmm. show appreciation, say thank you. That's important. And today you can say thank you with a note, with an email, with a video, with a, you know, personalize is the key. And then my dad said, Great idea. Let's take it to the next level. Dad's always trying to one up my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so he、uh, said, Next week, I want you to call the parents after they've received the thank you note, thank them again, and then ask them how they like the show. In other words, get feedback.、Mm-hmm. And then get specific. Say, What did you like about the show? What were your favorite tricks? He said, After a while, you'll start to hear the same tricks over and over again from different people, and you will notice people don't talk about certain tricks. He says, get rid of those tricks, replace them with tricks they will talk about.、Mm-hmm. Now, I had no idea. We're showing appreciation, getting feedback, listening to the customer, and then acting on it. Process improvement, enhancing the experience, whatever you want to call it. That's what was happening. And I'm age 12 and I'm learning this. Now, this is how I started to run my business. My dad would say, What time's the show? One o'clock. What time do you think you should be there? I don't know, five minutes to one. He goes, No. Even though you're ready to set up pretty much right when you walk in the door, you should show up early and you know, don't let the parents start freaking out. So, maybe 15, 20 minutes before the show, you walk in and then there's this little sigh of relief. They don't have to worry about it anymore. But when you get closer to like four or five minutes away, they're going to worry whether you're even showing up or not. And another great lesson. So, you know, not just show up, but show up on time, which to the customers on time means even a little bit early.、Mm-hmm. So, I was learning. The tenants, if you will, of customer service at a very young age. So, what happened、uh, when I graduated college? I was, I knew I didn't want to be a magician. <laughs> I had worked in nightclubs. So, I graduated and, four, you know, from 14 years old, I mean, thir- 12 through like even 18, I'm doing birthday parties. But at 14, I worked in my first nightclub. Age、yeah. 16, I'm working on the weekends at the Playboy Club doing comedy and magic. Through college, I'm working, I'm having a time of my life. And, but I realized I got bored because you, know, you do an act, the same act over and over again. And that's okay. But I said, what can I do? I saw a couple of motivational speakers. Just, I was working for an oil company.、Mm-hmm. Um, I'd done summer jobs with them. And in college, I worked for them pretty much full time while I still did my magic shows. So, college, magic shows, work, and maybe a little social life. Graduate college, still working for them. And I tell you, it was, I graduated in like end of May, early June. 
And I remember being brought into the office in September, just three months later, and I'm told they're selling the company. Mm -hmm. go, what am I going to do now? I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life here. Well, rude awakening. So I said, you know what? I'm going to start my own business. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But when I saw these professional speakers, a guy named Zig Ziglar, mm -hmm. who many people know is a motivational speaker, Tom Hopkins, who's still alive today, is an unbelievable speaker, even, even at his age. I thought, saw those two guys, and that's what I'm going to do. And I decided I'm going to talk about customer service. So 1983. I know, I look a lot younger than that. And hopefully I act a lot younger than that. My, my wife says, you're like a child sometimes. And she's right. It's good. It's good. <laughs> so, but that's where it all started. And if I think back to what I learned as a child and what I tell companies to do today, yeah. when it comes to, you know, you got to express appreciation. You got to give a great experience. What does your customer want and expect? But get the feedback, listen to it, act on it. Those are the things I was learning when I was young. Had no idea it was called customer service and customer experience. So I bet you weren't expecting that long of an answer for the first question. No, it was really <laughs> good. I liked it. Now, I mean, you said with the magic tricks, it got old because you're doing the same. You know, there's only certain things you can do with that. You've written five books. Is that correct? Actually, seven. And seven? The, uh, eighth, eighth and ninth are actually kind of being written at the same time. But the eighth one uh, hopefully come out next year. Awesome. So how have you maintained your complete passion for it like you know because you write it right you write over sure. and over and over and so let me just tell you in the magic world and i'm still a practicing magician ah. i practice you know i have my guitars in the background i have magic books i still practice my card tricks the nice thing about you know music and magic is is there's so much variety of material but when you are hired to do a show you have your a material and that's the show that you do and what I found is when I was working in nightclubs, doing two and three shows a night, two nights a week, that was the same show every time. And, you know, I'd swap some things out for my personal entertainment pleasure. But I realized if I'm going to go to work full time, that's I'll go to Vegas. I'll do I'll be in a review show. I'll do five nights a week, six nights a week, two shows a night, same show. And, and I know how it works. You have this time slot. Everything's approved. You can't change. That's going to be that's a grind. So. When I do my speech, kind of the same, except this is the difference. I'm going to work for your company today. I'm going to work for a completely different company. I may do a very similar speech, but the audience is going to hear it a different way. So I'll use different words, different terminology. You know, I just finished doing an interview where all we talked about was cloud-related services and how to scale a customer service organization to be bigger and go remote and that type of thing. I'm never going to talk about that in front of grocery store managers or, you know, car dealer owners, you know, so uh, it's, it's really, uh, I love to learn about new businesses, and I get to apply some of these basics to the business. So I keep studying, I, st I read a tremendous amount, and that keeps me fresh and, and ongoing. Ah, so you mentioned some of your hobbies, and I noticed that you play hockey, and you love the St. Louis Blues. How did, where, where did that come in? <laughs> so, uh, when I was a little kid, I played hockey one year, and then uh, parents got divorced, and my mom said, "Okay, outside of school, you get two act or you get one activity." And each one, my brother and my sister and my each, we each had two. I was playing hockey and doing magic shows, and I I kind of liked the money I made doing magic shows. So I said, <laughs> "I'll do magic shows," and <laughs> that was a smart move, I think. But uh, when I was a little kid, even 1967, the Blues came to St. Louis. My dad would take me. And I remember the first year the Blues made it to the Stanley Cup Finals. They never won a game, but I remember being there, and I remember the cup being given away. I'm going, Dad, what's going on? I don't understand. Well, it took 50-some-odd years later, and I was, you know, I watched the whole thing. I was so entrenched. I was even, I had the honor of being in the parade. Um, with the. I actually carried a flag with the players as we paraded down Market Street in St. Louis. One of the greatest days of my life. I have, you know, my kids. My wedding, because you have to say those things. <laughs> and I have the, the parade at the, with the St. Louis Blues. <laughs> so, so well, what can you learn from the St. Louis Blues about great customer experience? Oh man! So I wrote an article. So you're gonna you're gonna test my memory right now. <laughs> uh, Craig Barubi is the coach, and there were three, really three very specific strategies he had number one is he said 
uh, and I'm going to try to remember these. I can't right. promise you I will, but I'll, I know number one was he said, you're all very highly paid professionals. Mm. And we, and he says, I, as the coach, expect you to do your very, very best. Mm -hmm. If you do anything less than your best, you'll be sitting on the bench. Number two, this is a team sport. I don't care if you're the best player on the team. You recognize that your other teammates are there to support you and you are there to support them. So there is a big uh, issue about teamwork. And number three, see if I remember number, oh, number three he says, it's okay to fail. I want you to push yourself. So those are the three, he believes that those three simple ideas, which is what he preached, because in, in the hockey season last year, in January, before the Blue, was, it was actually um, January, a year ago, before the, when the Blues were playing, they were in the very last place. The coach that was there was fired, and Craig Berube was asked to take over. They were, they, they were the worst place, and they came back and came back, and they had this winning streak, and all of a sudden, they're in first place. All of a sudden, they win the Stanley Cup Finals. Okay, unbelievable story. So... I, I personally think the simplicity of focusing on three ideas. So let's take it to the support world, customer service. Number one, it's real simple. The win is customer walks away happy. So let's talk about anybody that's paid to be on the front line is considered to be a paid professional. And you better do your best because that's your performance. It's like walking out on stage as, a, as an actor, walking or skating onto the ice as a, a hockey player or hitting the field as a football player or whatever you're expected you're a paid professional number two there are going to be times you need help and recognize the person to the right and the left of you or perhaps it's your manager if you're working remotely we're just a zoom call away to get the advice and the support that we need so we have that team opportunity because really at the end of the day it's not me working with the customer it's my company who i represent my team trying to take care of that customer and number three Let's see, let's talk about expecting to fail. There's an old, I, I actually put this in one of my books, uh, Amaze Every Customer Every mm -hmm. Time. Mm -hmm. There's an idea that one to say yes, two to say no. Mm -hmm. And the concept behind that is you give permission to the person on the front line to take care of your customer, guest, member, whatever you want to call them, client. You give permission for them to do that and you let them go as far as they can. And you give, you know, if you hire good people and you train them right, they're paid professionals. They should be allowed to go as far as they can. There is a metaphorical line in the sand that you don't want them to cross, but you yeah. want them to push as far as they can to get there. And so if they try something and they think they can do it and you give them parameters, it shouldn't cost the company money, shouldn't hurt a reputation, needs to be legal. Okay. Um, and then, um, you know, needs to take care of the customer. I mean, those are some basic, there's probably more to it than that, but if you can say yes to all of those things that, you know, or no to being illegal, but yes to it's good for the company and it's good for the customer. It's not going to cost the company any money. You could say, you know, it's working, do it. And then come back and tell your manager, Hey, this is what I did today. What do you think? And the managers will go, that's fantastic. I'm going to share that with the entire team. Okay. Or the manager is going to say, here's a, another way you could have approached it. Or the manager is going to say, don't do that again. No matter what, you now know what to do or not to do the next time. So one to say yes means I, as a person, it takes one to say yes. But if I can't figure out how to say yes, I'm going to have to think about maybe I got to say no. I better go check with my manager or teammate first. So it takes at least two people to say no. So I can't say no arbitrarily on my own unless I have already been taught that no is the answer. Because once I go back to my manager and I ask if no is the answer, no will always be the answer. Leadership has to recognize that's an important lesson that they teach everybody. What's okay to do and not okay to do. And it's not a, well, it's sometimes okay to do it or not. Teach people the right way. So, um, gosh, I don't know if we got off on a tangent, but but there is a, a good example of whatever we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Say no. So, um, so you mentioned guitars. I saw you playing that. I mean, how do you find the time to do all this? It's, it's oh, fantastic. Man. I am never bored. As a matter of fact, there's not enough hours in the day for me to do all the fun things I love to do. And by the way, what we're doing right now, I don't know if you can tell, I am thoroughly enjoying myself. First of all, this is not an interview. It is an interview. It's not a, I ask a question, you give me an answer. We're having a great conversation. Yeah. I can get into that. And I'm happy to do interview traditional styles too, but this is more fun. So when I get home from work, and by the way, I put in, when I'm in my office, because a lot of times I'm out on the road, 
traveling, doing speeches. Uh, but I come back, I get here about 6.30 in the morning, maybe seven, and I get home about 6.30 at night. And, you know, I may sneak away for a couple hours to work out or whatever, but I love it. I get home, love hanging with my wife. We watch a dinner or TV show after dinner because we got the whole Netflix. By the way, after the coronavirus, we've watched the entire Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it. But, you know, we might have a favorite show. And I'll go in my, my I call it my man cave. I've got like nine guitars. I've yeah. got 1,700 magic books. I've got a keyboard. I've got drums. And I can... You can lock me in there for a while. I'll be happy. <laughs> I just you know slip some food under the door or whatever. So uh, it's it's uh, it's my passions. Uh, I love life. I play golf. I like to bike ride, and I mean I play play tennis, play hockey two to three days a week. Yeah, uh, I, I saw you cycling. You're cy cycling with people. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been lately. We've, uh, the guys who I play hockey with on Saturdays were looking for something to keep us in halfway decent shape, um, and so we've all been going out every Saturday morning. We been averaging about 40 to 50 miles for guys that don't normally ride. That's, that's pretty good. But wow. yeah, we always end with a really good lunch. We pick it up and go to the park and we practice social distancing <laughs> and, and have lunch. Absolutely. Now, I mean, you've done a ton of speaking. I mean, did speaking come naturally to you or did you have to work at it? Well, think about it. I had the entertainment background. Yeah. Yeah. But I got to tell you, I was very nervous all, mm -hmm. and I still get nervous. Mm -hmm. I don't get nervous. Like, shaking i'm so nervous yeah. that that's those that kind of nervousness has gone away the anticipation and the uh, excitement so even as a kid performing in front of a little kids for birthday parties i would be literally almost shaking and i would have to really push myself to do this so and then i got more comfortable but i was still always nervous and i will tell you when i first started speaking if you gave me an audience more than 100 people mm. i wasn't freaking out but i was you know the butterflies and maybe my leg would shake it i mean they were they're nervous and today um it's a different kind of nervous so there's three things i learned okay. number one is you have to know your material and if you know your material well you could and you've got to know it inside and out and and by doing that if the slides i don't really use slides to help me prompt. And it wasn't until just recently I started using slides because the audience wants them. And when we do virtual presentations, they're really important. But slides, um, if they break down and there's no slides, can I do the speech without the slides? And the answer is not only can I do it, I can do it backwards, forwards. Mm -hmm. I can mix up the numbers if I have a you know, five-step process. I will just do that because I know it. Number two, um, you have to know your audience. So if you know your audience, you know what material is going to work best for them and you understand, and that only comes from planning and talking to the client, you know, those two things right away, it's hard to fail. Now there's a third piece and that is know yourself. And by that, I mean, I know that on speech day, night before I'm in bed by 10, I've got to get my seven to eight hours sleep, no matter what I may be getting, if the flights are late and delayed, I get it. I'll sleep on the plane. My goal is to get as much sleep as I can because I know how I perform at my best. And so anybody that does a presentation, that's great advice. I think for anybody, you, number one, know your material, know who you're talking to and know yourself, know what it takes for you to perform at your best. Mm. So for people that don't understand what preparation for a speech is, how long does it take you to know your material? Like how much time do you put in per hour presentation? Or is it, can you give people any idea how hard you yep. work at it? Sure. There are times if you called me and said, Shep, I need you to fill in for a speaker tomorrow. Yeah. I have, I have my, I, I have a speech I could do. There's yeah. no doubt. Okay. I could just, yeah. I just got to psych myself into it and I'm there. But in a typical speech, I would like to spend at least an hour on an initial content call mm -hmm. to understand what the client's needs are. Then I'm going to actually write an outline on the speech. Then I'm going to go back to the client and I'm going to run that by the client. If the client says, yes, great. Now I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'd say over the hump. And then it's just a matter of, I mean, I know all the material already. I've written it. I write articles. I use a lot of it from speech to speech. But now how do I make this apply? to this audience that I'm talking to. That's the next big step. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love to, if I'm going to do a morning speech, I love going to breakfast and, and talking, sitting down with people. I don't know what little insight I'll get. Now, I don't go out the night before and I don't really learn that much by watching an awards banquet, but I will learn if I can sit and have dinner with them beforehand. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, if I get in early enough, I don't mind stopping by and, you know, 
even watching a, a, another session because I just want to get a feel for it. Yeah, I'm not going to say it takes 10 hours to do one one hour speech, but sometimes it does. I have to, I don't want to be tricked uh, into uh, uh, somebody asking me a question that I'm not prepared for. By the way, if I'm not prepared, you learn, you do not fake it. You said <laughs> that is a great question. And I think that's something we'll have to talk about offline. This is a yeah. big answer. And I go, <laughs> okay, get me the information. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Now, um, you have a podcast, you've interviewed a lot of people. I mean, what, what interview stands out? I, I, I was listening to you one, you were talking to a horse, the Schultz. I oh, think. my gosh, one of my service idols, <laughs> service heroes, that's a better word. Horse Schultz is the first president and co founder of the Ritz Carlton organization. Yeah, I've admired that company since pretty much day one. I remember when they first, I was very young, but I remember when the Ritz became, went from a, a recognized name from as a boutique hotel to becoming this national, inter, then eventually international chain. Yeah. And uh, as I understood, they won the Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award. I actually did an article, and this I think was back in the 80s, yeah. on that. And I just kept studying them and studying them. And you know what, really what they do is pretty simple. It's I mean, it, it doesn't take a lot to figure that out. And you just have to have the discipline to do it. Uh, so what they did, Horst Schultz came up with a credo. Mm -hmm. We're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. It's nine words long. That's what the whole Ritz-Carlton is about. Then there's 24 what they call gold standards that are what are used to train these people. The, the, the employees, the ladies and gentlemen that work at the Ritz mm -hmm. are trained on 24 gold standards. Every single day, one of those gold standards is represented at the Ritz. So what happens is today might be Monday, Tuesday, when it doesn't matter what day of the week it is, doesn't matter what time of the month or the year, we're going to go through them starting with one and go through all 24. It takes 24 days and then we repeat. So at the end of the year, the average employee will hear about, the, will hear each one of these about 10 times or so, nine or 10 times. Some will happen on the weekends. They won't be there a day they're off. Get it. But what's really cool is I live here in St. Louis and where do you live? Uh, I live in Vancouver, BC, Canada. So uh, I don't know. I know there's four seasons up there. Is there a Ritz Carlton in Vancouver? It, there is not. Okay, there should be. <laughs> there should okay. be, absolutely. <laughs> but if there was a Ritz Carlton in Vancouver uh, and you went and sat in on a pre shift meeting, and by the way, every manager spends a moment or two talking about the gold standard, you would be experiencing the same standard that I experience here in St. Louis or that in a, uh, one of the ladies and gentlemen who work at the Ritz would experience in Abu Dhabi. On the other side of the world. So uh, the point is they are uh, relentless about it. It's, it's um, just such a discipline. It seems like that's so easy to do, but the discipline of doing it all the time and making sure you have the time is the key. And, and it just, it's constantly in front of them. They're constantly being reminded. They hire good people, they train them well, and then they constantly reinforce it. That's what creates the sustainability of it all. What is sort of the uh, the future look like for a chef? Like, what what do you what do you you have more books out? Like, yep. what's your um, vision? I'm very excited. The next book is going to be. I mean, they're all about great customer service, but yeah. this one specifically, I want to talk about how you get customers to come back, not oh. just deliver an experience that would make them want to come back. Because all the metrics that are out there, there's you know customer satisfaction scores, effort scores, success scores, the net promoter scores. Here's one that I think is important. Good metric. Did the customer come back? <laughs> Pretty much that simple. And then once they come back, you can look at metrics like they spend more than the customer that doesn't come back, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but no, on the single, you know, every interaction they have with you, every time they visit you or buy something from you, it's a typical larger spend. There's all kinds of stats and facts behind that. But what drives making somebody want to come back? Okay. And I differentiate between what loyal customers are because people coming back aren't necessarily loyal. They're just repeat customers. We love repeat customers, nothing wrong with it. But if we could take it to the next level, and that is to create an emotional connection that's beyond, I like doing business. They're always friendly. And you know what? They're very convenient. Well, I, you know, I wrote the book, The Convenience Revolution, which I think is one of the best books I've written ever, because it's all about the idea of being easy to do business with, because whoever is easiest will win. They'll mm -hmm. win over almost anything, including price. So um, and that's great. That's going to get people to come back, a convenient experience. But now I want to create this emotional experience. And it doesn't have to be other than they're always so friendly. Mm. That is an emotional connection. I can trust them. That's emotional. Okay. They're convenient. That's process. Mm. Make sense? 
And, and I think if you can combine both of those emotional and, and what I would call the, the basic strategy in the process, well, you've got an opportunity to create uh, from go from repeat customer to loyal customer. And, you know, when everybody says, oh, we have a great loyalty program, it's uh, many times it's not a loyalty program. It's a repeat business program. And remember that because I know as much as I love flying on my airline, if they took away the perk of the free first class upgrade, I like that. That's my big perk. I'm yeah. going to go find an airline that gives me the free first class or if it doesn't matter anymore, then it doesn't matter anymore. One of the one of the cool things I, I heard you say on one of your live streams was, um, you know, instead of focusing on just like one great uh, moment with the customer, is just being better than average and and yeah. all there is. I re that really struck a chord because I think a lot of people they they do this great gesture and then they don't keep it up or it breaks down in some other part. And uh, I thought you really spoke well to that. Uh. Well, thanks. Well, let's talk about that that great gesture. And you you used your hands, and I I know a lot of people are listening. So you used your hands to like exploding great gesture. Those happen once in a while. And I'll tell you when they happen. If, if you come to me with a problem and I like stay late, work all night and come back the next day and it's resolved, you go, wow, that was great. That was amazing. That was over the top. Okay. Yeah. If I'm a server at a restaurant and I overhear a couple talking about how it's their 20th anniversary, right? Yeah. I'm going to surprise them with a piece of cake and a candle, right? You know, so the point is, is you can't wait for the big problem to fall in your lap to go over the top, or you can't wait to overhear something you're not probably going to hear anyway, to make these happen. But what you can do is you can be consistently a little above average. And back to what Horace Schultz said at the Ritz Carlton. And I, you know, I've had this philosophy for years and years. And when I was interviewing him, he, I said, so what does it take to be that amazing brand that you created? He says, just be a little bit better than average all the time. I go, that's what I've been talking about. But there's got to be a number. How much better than average do you have to be? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And without hesitation, he said 10% better. Ah. Went, oh, wow. So that's not a lot better. So think about this. On a scale of one to five, five is amazing. One is poor. Okay. Where's average? It's three. It's in the middle, right? Yeah. So uh, you got one, two, you know, poor, fair, satisfactory, or average, yeah. uh, good, and excellent or amazing or whatever yeah. you want to call it. So the way to become recognized as amazing is just be better than average by 10%. But here's the key, all of the time. It's the all of the time. It's the consistent and predictable above average experience where people say they're always friendly. They're always so knowledgeable. Mm. They always get back to me quickly. They, even when there's a problem, I know I can always count on them. Always followed by something positive is what you're shooting for. When that happens, great. And every once in a while, you get to go over the top and create that great experience. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, connecting those two things, right? So once those over the top things happen, you celebrate it, you communicate it. So everyone's kind of sensitized to and look for those things, but 10% uh, better on it on a day-to-day -day, uh, consistent basis. Yeah. And, and it, that's the key day-to-day. Uh, -day. And so I, I talk about other, other ideas as well. Um, I have the idea on consistency. And by the way, that's the word always and consistency are synonymous. But when people come to work, they should put forth the same consistent effort day in and day out and think of themselves as the actor that takes the stage to do their, I want to do the best performance I've ever done tonight. Okay. Or the, the athlete that takes the field, I'm going to try my best. We need to win, you know, and it happens in business too. Uh, Richard Burton, who's a famous actor who many people may not even remember him. He's Gosh, I don't know how. I, I don't remember ever. I think I'm like, oh, is that Richard Burton when I see an old movie? That's pretty cool. Because he said something really neat. He was best known for what he did on stage. And he had won some Tony Awards. And he used to say, I want to be so good tonight that I cheat the audience that was here last night. <laughs> In other words, I want to be better today than yesterday. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Now, that's a heck of an attitude, right? Wow. Yeah. So if we can have people who want to be better today, every day than yesterday, then I think that's a relentless effort on excellence. You may or may not achieve it and it doesn't matter. It's the effort that makes the difference. And, and I think a lot of times uh, customers will recognize the effort. I'm in a restaurant. The food is bad. I send it back. Something else is wrong. I send it back. But the effort the server is making to try to make it right means I'm coming back to try it again. Because it, it just, that effort makes up 
for flaws that might happen along the way. Now, if there were always consistent flaws and you can't count on the experience to be, you know, usually the way it's supposed to be, well, then you'll probably end up moving on to a different restaurant or any other type of business. But, you know, uh, excellence in your attitude and the effort that you put forth, I think, goes a long way to uh, basically overcoming any bumps along the way. And by the way, when you do it right, you train your customers to tell you about problems so mm -hmm. that you can resolve them. And when they know that, I call that creating a demanding customer. There's, there's two types of customers uh, that follow. The demanding customer goes one of two ways. And were you on my last live stream? I think you were, where I talked about, uh, this was the epilogue in my book, um, um, Be Amazing or Go Home, where I had the, the habits. Uh, or no, no, it was the Ace Hardware book, the Amaze yeah, Every I Customer. Love, yeah, I love yeah, the Ace that yeah. I call it the Ace Hardware book because it uses Ace throughout. As, as a, it's not really about Ace. It just uses this great retailer as a great example over and over again. But you create a demanding customer. And there's two types of demands you want. You want your customer to demand you give them the best. And if you teach them right, they will then come to you with the problems that they have. And you train them to do that. But the other is to be so good that if the customer were to go to do business with your competitor and they expected the same level of service that you gave them, the competitor would go, oh my gosh, this customer is so demanding. And that so demanding is our normal. That's what we want to create.